you, thank you for not trying. Um, yeah, to, to read it all out. <laughs> right, I'm going to start with the new ones, I think, which I haven't read out before. So I'm not going to try to read it uh, This one's called House Cat. I hate myself, I think. I wouldn't say that aloud, though, even to myself alone. I'm silent on my own, but for the clink of dishes, the wet sound of coffees wash against my teeth. Our neighbour's cat, voluptuous with canned meat, stares at me from its spill of sun, that vacant splat of face, the way they groom themselves disgusts me, the small pink tongue of self-regard. Even when I say I hate myself, Inside my skull, I flinch a bit. It's so attention-seeking. I don't know whose. Um, and this is another new one. I was just talking to Wayne about the fact that my children have had nits several times this year. Um, I don't know that there are any knit poems. Sorry, I'm going to make you all scratch your heads now. Um, but um, I was thinking John Dunn's The Flea, but this is, this is the headlouse. Also, my, my son really cares about animals, which is lovely. He's always sort of rescuing bugs and rescuing snails and things. And he was like, do we have to kill them? And I didn't, I didn't really know what to say. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, but this is sort of about that. The limits of our own I suppose. The head louse. Mark this knit, the gritty little shit. Who can respect a faint speck? Don't they know where they're not wanted? Irritating as fuck, ash flecks burning for juice. Who can we hate if not them? I inculcate the killer instinct. Think of how they pierce defences, make of friendly gestures a smuggler's route, pervert our hospitality. In dark, lice tap my daughter's head, tiny, unsettling thoughts. They scratch to be let in, faceless sucker by. I scarify my children's skulls, their golden shores of hair drench up dust bunnies, scaly bodies small as not at all, obligate parasite. Are we obliged to host? Host what? Dirt, moats of bloodthirst. Their leap of faith is not my leap, an infestation tests all our compassion. A Buddhist might escort each louse to a steep-sided bowl, transpose those sentient seeds, but where? Loose them where, except in hair? Oh, jiggling crumbs, I crush them, flick, so what? Wouldn't a mother chimp? I'm only grooming fondly, no tsunami, not a monster before whom crowds scatter. Your perspective's out of kilter, they're too minuscule to matter. Comb through damp hair, crown to tips. It smells of sulfurous pits, but the solution leaves things manageable, clean. A 15-minute wait. Nymphs suffocate, and now it's late. What brushes me at midnight, finally, as a web? What trembles there? If I'm a giantess, they're jack. The grit outwits me, still relentless, irritant. What ominous thing ticks in my hair? A jumping pulse, the haunted house is me, and it's the speckled ghost. All winter I will claw at us, then call it care. From where I am, it is. I keep thinking of myself as a haunted house now. I <laughs> scratch, scratch my head. There we go. Um, okay, I'm going to read a couple of oldies now. Um, I've been thinking a lot about fairies lately. Um, the children's book, which has not been announced yet, so I probably shouldn't, but it's coming out next year, um, is based on an Arthurian myth and contains um, fairies, full-size fairies. And I'm also working on a new translation of Sir Orfeo, which is, I'm hoping Simon Armitage hasn't got this pause on it. But it's basically it's Orpheus, but set in Arthurian Britain, and uh, instead of um, Eurydice being taken to the underworld, she's taken She's taken by the King of the Fairies to Fairyland. It's absolutely amazing. So I've been thinking a lot about fairies, and I thought I'd read this old one, which is one of my favourites from Changeling, um, called Tamlin's Wife. This is my first fairy poem, and in this, um, Tamlin is basically going to be taken forever to the fairy world, um, but his love, his wife, is told um, she can keep him if, for one long night, she 
holds him and doesn't let go. And he's going to transform into all sorts of things in her arms. Um, but she must not let go of it. It struck me as a, a great metaphor for marriage. Um, Tamlin's wife. They sat us in a pale and private place, quietly conveyed the worst, explained the curse that was your fate, and how for one long, ill-starred night you turn and burn, become all beasts you could dream of. I think that I cried out. They said that if I want to have you, then I have to hold, to hang on tight and not let go and not let go until you wake entire again within my arms, pale skin, dark tufts of hair, long bones, in crumpled daylight. And now the sun has sunk, dark taken hold, and in my hug you jolt to sudden adder, X mark, zigzag, venom, quick then rear to brute neck, dog as black as forest and spume jawed. I tell myself that you are still my love, although I'm wet with blood, and you're a lynx, filthy with fingerprints, clean pink mouth, snapping teeth near heart, my throat. I keep you caught and don't let go and don't let go and feel your skull become a bleached December sun, your eyes hot coals, you burst to blaze, a wicker man. You're searing through my fingers, molten light. Said, Dear husband, all those things I prize in you, your beauty, kindness, laugh, are stripped off one by one, but even with them gone, my boy stares out from stricken shapes, and love has no conditions, none. Um, and I think I'll read maybe a couple of sonnets. Sonnets have got very fashionable lately, sonnets <laughs> everywhere, but um, I like the ones that rhyme. <laughs> is how to rhyme a sonnet. Um, this is called Dinner for Two and it's set in um, Sainsbury's essentially. Dinner for Two. The CCTV's globed eye stares me down as in the supermarket's blinding maze I pick spice from the Indies, Asian prawns and blueberries as dark as Incan skies, New Zealand lamb and Guatemalan peas. A girl tuck snow the air miles at Mange 2, and I too feel that bland guilt nag at me. But words of worlds are nothing next to you. I take my plunder home, prepare a feast to show I care to counter your day's stress. I pour Sancerre like perfume on your feet, the spoils of sea and sky, the east, the west. The earth contracts. Our room is everywhere. In love, one kiss, and any trade seems fair. Um, and another sonnet from my more recent book, Incarnation, which is all about motherhood in different ways. Um, and uh, this opens the book. Uh, this is a very interesting Shakespeare's um, procreation sonnet, where he's sort of persuading the young man he ought to have children. And I thought it would be interesting to have a conception sonnet. Especially these days, as you feel the opposite of them, you're, you're, you're thinking maybe I shouldn't have children. Um, what world are we bringing them into? And this is my conceptual sonnet. Jordan, September 2012. The Dead Sea's senseless brine spits me back up. The dry dawn brings mosaics of crocodiles, lamb fat and waspy figs and chariot ruts and gargle smoke and broken citadels. Elijah's flaming horse and sunburnt tombs. Iraq and Syria and Palestine make borders swept with refugees whose homes are shaken bones. The bank is occupied. Then in my flesh, the sperm and egg collide. I shudder in the dry cave of our bed as life explodes, a bomb, a rose, a tide, a sun pours through my eyelids, Petra red. Yes, this is what the world needs. More of us. The foxes scream the dunes down with disgust. Um, and I'm going to read um, another one from um, this book. Um, this is a slightly longer one. This is called Supper. Excuse me if I take a breath. Find it in my... oh, there it is. Supper. <laughs> this is a 
about the sort of rhetoric around motherhood, I suppose, the, the discourse around motherhood, um, which I find quite <coughs> toxic. Your negative thoughts might harm the fetus and you might abort the fetus or think about aborting the fetus or just not be maternal and you got pissed at that wedding and karma can harm the fetus. <coughs> You might inhale or eat a soft boiled egg or brim a boiling bath or have more than 1.5 cups of coffee. You might wake to find you slept on your back or your right or is it left side. You might slip or run or lift or weed or dye your hair or use most household products. You might forget your folic acid and you're overweight or underweight or 38 and that elderflower presse you just treated yourself to at the bar can cause gestational diabetes and you didn't have the Downs test or had the test and you're not doing yoga or hypnobirthing and stress can harm the fetus, you might not have bought a birthing ball. You might opt for an epidural. You might squeeze for the drugs so they might have to cut you open. You might have no milk or sour milk or mastitis or loathe the way your nipples fizz, how they squirt like a clown's flower brooch. You might look at her and feel underwhelmed. You might drop her or break that delicate neck or that terrible vulnerable pit in the back of her skull. You might overheat or swaddle or bring her in your bed or fall asleep whilst feeding. You might let your hand lose contact with the baby in the bath or leave the pram a moment or leave her in the car seat or not strap her in the car seat properly. You might own an envious cat. You might leave a window open or a door or let her play outside and supervise like pedo bait or fox bait as the tabloids will imply. You might have blinds and sockets and stairs and a pond or know someone with a pond. Also, you might let her watch too much CBeebies or have a dummy or cheap shoes or food with too much salt or MMR or pink plastic princess crap or be spoiled. You might make inappropriate comments about her weight. You might give her your nose. You might give her poor hand-eye coordination or a flaw in the chambers of her heart. Also, letting her cry out can damage her brain and you have a routine or no routine. They're probably yummy or slummy, silting up cafes with your bugaboo and NCT buddies overthinking latching or abandoning her to zitty sitters so you can get drunk and be clumsy or lurid or not there. You might be cold and hard like all those bags of express milk that tumble out and hurt your feet each time you open the freezer. You might be too much too smothery, eating her toes and pressing moist, desperate kisses on her tiny, struggling head, or gaga goo goo, mummy stinks and ickle bit of milky poo as you sink into the sicky sofa. The bad meat leaks still swap bucketing your nick as you're so torn it hurts to fart even. You might not have washed up or opened the curtains and you're watching loose women, you're so pathetic, pathetic. You might have sex within her earshot and she'll think you're being stabbed and be traumatised or jealous or a lecturer, or a daddy will divorce you or dick around because you slapped off from perennial massage or pelvic floor exercises and you've lost your libido and you saw the business end. Also, you might have a career. You'll be in a meeting when she says her first word which will be mama with the nanny or you might be unable to afford a nanny or she won't take the bottle or they won't let you go part time or will make you redundant and you'll throw yourself into Bake Offs making cupcakes so sophisticated they express your inner death. And did you forget to sign on to that nursery waiting list two years before she was born? And you say you haven't been to Little Movers? The health visitor might say she isn't gaining weight, her pencil point wounding the chart in the wrong place. She might call in social services. They might find out you're alone or on benefits or medication or have damp and take your baby. You might deserve it. You might smack her or beat her or stuff fags out on her succulent little thighs or lock her under stairs or chain her to a bed or let her sit in her own shit all day. You might sell her or pimp her or mutilate her genitals or expose her on a mountainside or leave her with an uncle or a priest or touch her or not touch her or take photos. Also, you might watch her starve because you brought her into a world with finite resources and an unsustainable rate of population growth. You might watch her fly down to her eye. You might let a celebrity adopt her. You might watch her die of a treatable disease. You might watch her die of an untreatable disease in a kid's ward with murals of Dumbo or in the night garden. You might live in a war zone and be unable to protect her. You might not live in a good catchment area. You might live in a poor catchment area and be unwilling to run a church tombola to protect her. You might not be able to stop climate change. You might not be able to offer her hope. You might smother her then gash yourself or hold her and jump off a cliff or use that knife, that knife, the one you looked at too long in the kitchen this morning even though it goes without saying you don't want to, never could. You might lie awake at 3am listening for her breath or not love her enough or love her so much it's a sickness, it's sick. You might go mad. <laughs> And, and 
Catherine collection and it's, um, I took my son to the Horniman Museum when he was about four and he always loved it, it's all sort of taxidermied animals and then one day he just started screaming in the middle of that and I thought, oh my god, he's, he's realised what death is. Well, he just wanted a snack, but that's what it's going. This is, uh, uh, this is after Elizabeth Bishop actually, her poem in the waiting room, I think it's called, when she realises she's a human for the first time, she's a little girl. It's got, the, it's got the same rhythm. In the Horniman Museum. In South London, on a Sunday, we have seen the scratching chickens and alpacas being spitty. When the rain drives us indoors, where the taxidermy is waiting, and you race around glass coffins, the hummingbirds in freezes, vulpus vulpus, and the service posed as if in toy shop windows and the walrus like a punchline. Relation of pantroglodytes, your animal as they are, each captured by a caption in a tea trader's collection. He paid to have the world paused, all those thousand conscious seeings for one vision, all that I am turn to glaze for one man's gaze. I've not told you about death yet. Can you tell these birds are different? Do you think this heron cruel that he doesn't care about you? It's true, the heron doesn't. Caring something rare and fleeting. If the dead see anything, then it's as hard and black as glass. But your eyes are getting rounder, pointing dare at crocs and gibbons. And the peacocks stare in blueness. And we're falling through our days in this pissing, useless arc. While the clouds gather like stuffing. While the flood water ticks upwards. My child... You are an eye, through your two eyes, not yet dark. Can you see your wet-cheeked mother and the whole creaturely kingdom that is stood today before you in its opulence and armour that has held its breath this moment and is waiting for your judgement? Um, and I'll just read one short poem to finish. Um, I was lucky to have this poem nominated for the forward prize this year for best individual poem. And that was last time I was in Manchester actually in the autumn. It was a really good party. I was like coming to Manchester. And um, this is my pandemic poem, I suppose. Um, uh, but there was the, the first lockdown, which was spring, you could sort of everybody noticed nature a bit more and there was this really thick, thick pollen. Um, I've never noticed it before or since, but I sort of noticed it everywhere on, the, on our daily walks with the kids. It's about that. Pollen. The medium death chose this time was love. Kindness, or what we thought was kindness, was now harm. And it was best if we just locked ourselves away and didn't show we cared and hardly lived in weeks which were our work. One week, though, I recall the pollen came. Piled in our street like snow, or no, like baby hair. I saw a boy that stroked its fur, how on their walk girls kicked at it. Its carriage on the air from home to home, over fences, yards, the apple blossom, in through kitchen windows, to where we stared at screens on makeshift desks. Its waver on one currents of my breath, how my eyes streamed with tears. Tell me that you noticed. And did you close the window too? Uncertain now what you were meant to do with all that tenderness. Thank you very much.